that being said, on to our next presenter, um, the thought leadership. Uh, I was a part of that conversation. It was definitely a great conversation between uh, Clark and Alice. It's one thing I always feel like we're an industry and it's always reminded of the uh, the kindergartners fighting over the blocks and not wanting to share. So hopefully we can kind of break that paradigm shift and start sharing more and being more transparent in this industry. So Todd? Yeah, it was a, it was a great, lively conversation. Uh, Clark and Alice did a, a great job of, of bringing uh, really interesting perspectives. There's so much adversarial relationships going on in AEC, whether it's from uh, you know, the architects to the GCs or even with the, the tech providers being thrown in there too, that adds another little wrinkle uh, to it as well. And, and one of the things that got brought up was really the, the need to open our, our books and, and share where we're making our money, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, um, but really that, that goes a long way in the relationships to see, you know, where are you really trying to, to push on this project or in, uh, you know, wherever your, your, your role is. Uh, so I thought that, that was interesting. Uh, there's also a, a fear of, of losing your competitive advantage if you share data. So we had a conversation around that and, and how do we um, kind of encourage the industry to go through this really big fundamental mind shift in, in thinking about risk management and uh, data transparency and, and where that all um, kind of shakes out and how do we tell success stories better and get more people involved in that. All right. Uh, so we have our, our special spotlight uh, participants, Clark and Alice, that will be here to share their perspectives and, and help us really answer the, the following shared pain challenges on, on how we might convince the, the fragmented AC collaborators that are out there in the industry to align on standards in ways to combine the extrinsic with the intrinsic uh, values that, that we all have. So that everybody can uh, benefit from this digital transformation that we're all undergoing. So before we, we dive into that conversation and into our questions, I want to do some quick roundtable introductions because there's a whole lot of different perspectives throughout AEC here among this group. So excited for this conversation. Uh, Clark, do you want to kick us off and, and give us just a, a quick recap on your, your history and the perspective that you're coming from? Sure, can do that. Uh, Clark Davis, uh, I'm an architect um, and uh, been a, a major firm leader for a long time. I was uh, vice chair of HOK and managing principal of, of HOK's uh, offices here in St. Louis and, and in this part of the country. And um, several years ago, joined a national consulting group. Uh, there are about 14 of us who work exclusively within the industry. Uh, on um, strategic planning and leadership development, organizational change with architects and engineers and, and contractors and some owner organizations too. Um, I uh, uh, led, uh, while at HOK, led HOK's construction services group, which was set up as an internal uh, design build leadership group, which, uh, which I enjoyed. And um, have been leading for several years uh, an initiative, a research initiative that I'll touch on called Managing Uncertainty. Um, it has to do with uh, uh, really looking at the sources of, of the challenges we all face in this industry, uh, what some of the common causes are and how we can uh, improve the performance of projects and the industry as a whole. Awesome, thanks Clark. Welcome Alice, <laughs> glad the, the link worked. <laughs> Oh my God, I was so stressed <laughs> out for like 10 minutes. I was like, how do I get on? That makes it more entertaining that way. <laughs> you have I to know. figure it out. It's, it's a very exclusive group. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, could you give a, a high level um, bench point on, on you for those who may not know you and the perspective that you're, you're coming in with? Yes, awesome. Uh, so I'm Alice. 
Uh, my background is in construction operations and project management. So worked at DPR construction. Um, so I guess the perspective is mostly gonna be from that side to so a commercial general contractor. Uh, worked on various types of projects, some IPD and collaborative, some not so much. Um, also spent two and a half years in Singapore. So got to see kind of different cultures at play uh, on the construction projects. And now I work for Brick and Mortar Ventures. Um, we are a, I guess, construction tech VC. Um, and now I get to see different perspectives across the supply chain on uh, how to make decisions around projects and technology. Awesome. Thanks, Alice. So we're going to go around real quick, take about 30 seconds, let us know who you are, your industry perspective, and maybe what you hope to, to gain or, or add to this discussion. We're going to start with uh, Travis Voss, because you're, you're first up on my, my right. screen here. Uh, I'm Travis Voss. Um, I have this awesome job title of leader of innovative technologies here at the Helm Group, the mechanical division. Um, I'm also a co-host of the construction dork cast. Um, I guess, you know, what I'm hoping to do is kind of, if this is the thought leadership to, to push from a construction to constructors standpoint, push these, this need for standards and interoperability between our systems, because as a specialty contractor, we work in several of them. And it sure would be nice if we could all talk to each other easily. Nice. Awesome. Let's Thanks. go with the other Travis since we're on a Travis kick. <laughs> we get both Travises in this one. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm Travis Althaus. I'm an implementation service manager with Revisto. Um, and I'm here for a lot of the same reasons. Um, I come from industry um, before I was at Revisto. So I got to see and experience a lot of the... Um, non-connected environments we have for bet for lack of better term um and i just want to do my best to connect everybody and and see where i can help do that awesome cool benny let's go over to you my name is benny baltrotsky i'm the coo of m suite we have a fabrication or sort of BIM fab to field product. I also sit on the board of directors of the Construction Progress Coalition. And I normally jump in a different chat each time. This one sort of seemed interesting to sort of to see how we can better or how we can share the message in a better manner to get more people involved with uh, interoperability and continue to drive the industry forward. So excited to sit in and learn today. Cool. Thanks, Benny. Nick, let's go over to you. Hey, everybody. Uh, Nick Massey. I work for Haley and Aldrich. I'm a lean practitioner. Uh, we're, we're a geotechnical environmental engineering firm, but I came in through mechanical contracting and part of our lean practicing practitioner group. I help other um, external folks um, adopt lean. So I'm psyched about this because I think that the combo of a shared purpose and the leadership that brings shared purpose and giving people a system view, which is a lot of what I work on, are the two critical elements to become a learning organization. And that's what we need because I see is a big deal and we got to be learning fast. Amen. <laughs> uh, Aaron, let's go over to you. Hey guys, I'm Aaron Wright. I run the construction channel and we um, a YouTube channel and website where we tell stories about construction companies and technology. So nice to meet everybody. Mm. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Brett. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Brett Settles. I am the Global Director of Customer Success at Revisto. I oversee a team of approximately 15 uh, industry professionals across the A, the E, the C, and the O. My background, I spent about uh, six and a half years managing technology for an EPCM firm out of St. Louis. Clark, I'm also from St. Louis. I don't know if you're from here, but um, I, I am. Awesome. Well, it looks like I got some local friends in here. And um, I worked in the Autodesk channel for about five years before managing technology and actually started my career in civil engineering and GIS. And now I'm here building vertical things with all you guys. <laughs> A little bit of everything. <laughs> yep. Quite awesome. the generalist. <laughs> nice. Uh, Doug, let's go over to you. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Doug Shortridge. Uh, I'm a uh, building building trades guy, about 40 years in the plumbing side of things, mostly. Um, but I've got a natural innovation bug in me. I've had it since I was a kid. I was thinking about that this morning. I can blame some of this on Travis Voss because I met him over at Autodesk University a couple years ago. And uh, Kind of got it started again after I'd let it go for a while. And anyway, I'm working on some new stuff now. It's in the uh, combination of Contech and EdTech area, I would say. Um, I think it's probably something to pay attention to. I won't go into too many details about it, but happy to be here and listen and learn. And it's nice to see Alice as well. Awesome. All right, we're going to go Ezra and then Matthew. Sorry, I got to unmute there. Um, yeah, so I'm Ezra. Um, I come from the construction world, worked for a couple of different general contractors early on in my career. Uh, the last year and a half, I've been working in the technology side with a company called Join. We're focused on um, helping make better decisions during pre-construction and creating more collaboration across all the stakeholders involved on the project. Um, and then me personally, as one of the few black people in the AEC space, I've experienced a lot of systemic um, hurdles and ceilings. So I'm very passionate about reimagining solutions for systemic issues as they relate to our industry. So that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Thanks, Ezra. My turn now, I suppose. Um, my name is Matthew Krebs. I am the VDC technology manager for InTech Construction. We're a contractor and, and a Con, uh, and uh, we're a general contractor out of the Philadelphia area. Um, my background is actually on the design side. I am relatively new to the construction side of the industry. So now I am in a position where all of the stuff that I tried to teach people how to do, I am now on the receiving end of it and figuring out what to do with it on the construction side. Um, and really, I'm just looking forward to hearing what you all have been doing and what we can bring to Intech to kind of be better. Nice. Very cool. I think we got everybody. Did I miss anybody? Alrighty. Cool. Well, let's bring in Clark and Alice again. Uh, so kind of first question to hear from you two. Uh, what do you think are some of the kind of the underpinnings of some of the adversarial relationships in the, the AEC industry among all the, the various groups that we have? We're just diving right in. Okay. Alice, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, I guess I actually have a story, which I thought was very, like it blew my mind. Um, so I have a really good friend that I went to college with, um, ended up working for a general contractor after college. And I recently caught up with her. She went and so she was at a general contractor and then she decided that she really liked um, you know, working with the clients and and uh, coordinating design and stuff like that. So, so she ended up going back and getting her master's of architecture. And now she's like studying to pass all the exams and stuff like that. And when I caught up with her, she literally told me that in architecture school, they teach her to always second guess what the general contractor has to say. <laughs> Because, and it was, it was, it just blew my mind because it's like, okay, this is a pretty prestigious architecture school. Um, and like, I could see where it's coming from because we are a industry that's, that's kind of been built on, you know, a lot of silos and, you know, and that's where that adversarial relationship comes from, right? Every, everyone is kind of, you know, managing their contracts, managing their risk. Um, and there's kind of that, you know, double-edged sword of, you know, that double checking process of everything in construction, right? So it just kind of blew my mind that she said like in class, and this is, you know, just last year, they actually teach you to kind of think and just double check a lot of stuff. And, you know, and it was crazy because she came from the contractor's background and in class, she kind of felt like she had to defend herself <laughs> to all of these architects about, you know, the, the contractor's value. And, you know, I, Clark, I see you shaking your head and, and I like blew my mind when I saw that. And I know I, I don't have, or haven't had any conversations with um, friends who have gone through, you know, construction management courses or have gone through that. And I don't know what they teach in those universities or in those schools, but 
I thought that was pretty interesting and it and I'd actually love to hear from everyone else here like if in your training or in your background you've kind of been like taught you know certain ways about you know and that like just you know adds to the the cultural issues of our industry <laughs> all right I'll I'll pick up on that I think, I think your friend is going or went to the wrong school that's my, my quick response <laughs> But 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 I think the story you told is not uncommon. Uh, I'm sad to say, and I, I would you know get to that point this way. You know we all know that the industry that we're a part of is really complex, and it's gotten more complex uh, and more specialized, you know, over the decades and arguably over several centuries. You know we know everybody around the table here knows that you know we largely put together highly customized products, uh, thousands of components, hundreds of people, hundreds of contributors to that, uh, to that product. And very often the people involved, the people responsible for all that have never worked together before, right? You know, they're, they're either corporately or individually all new to the scene. And because of what we do, we all know that it takes a, you know, it really takes a team and it sounds trite, but it's true. And uh, sadly, you know, decades ago, I would argue even centuries ago, the industry began to break apart. You know, it became hopelessly fragmented in the way that, that the others have, have touched on already. Uh, when I was in architecture school, I had took a course called The History of the Architect, which was fascinating. And one of the things that was clear was that after uh, a, you know, after centuries of basically design build work by guilds that traveled around building cathedrals and great stuff. Uh, architects got the idea, you know, maybe in the 17 or 18, early 1800s, that, that they didn't want to mess with the, the, the dirty stuff anymore and wanted to just be design consultants and leave the messy work to somebody else. Uh, so in a way, you know, the industry divided between design and construction centuries ago and the design side with various engineering disciplines coming up the design side and the construction side have gotten more specialized. So it's just gotten worse and worse and worse and more and more divided. And I think sadly, as Alice pointed out, you know, the, the institutions, the professional organizations that we have to some degree have fostered that uh, fragmentation. You know, we, we've, we've perpetuated the idea that we're not in this together and that uh, it perpetuated the, the idea of this sort of adversarial relationship that, that uh, you know, that we all know too well. And so because, you know, the industry is so fragmented, it's so inefficient, you know, the, the very low productivity attributed to the construction industry that we've all seen and talked about is because of that. And so I think, you know, there's a, there's a, a huge demand from owners out there uh, for, reintegration of the industry that we're a part of. Uh, the industry is being driven back together, some of it kicking and screaming, but it's being brought back together because ultimately society and the people who are our customers want that. They want simplicity and accountability in the work that goes on. And so, you know, that's where uh, technology that so many of you are a part of and know a hell of a lot more about than I, uh, that's where technology is so critical because technology uh, isn't a delivery method by itself, but it's a an enabler uh, for a more integrated team approach that I think you know we all we all want. Um, and there are a lot of ways of of putting that kind of more integrated approach together, from you know a single source AEC companies to AEC and fabrication companies like Katera, uh, people who are doing development and design and construction. But I also think, and we, I'll stop here in a second, I also think you know, we can create the right kind of team environment among um, uh, people, among separate uh, design and construction firms um, if we bring the right people to the table at the right time and in the right way. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Thanks for the, the insights on, on both uh, good stuff there. There's a lot to unpack. <laughs> uh, so in creating that kind of team environment and trying to break down some of these adversarial 
walls and maybe knock down some of that thinking Alice to, to your story of <laughs> training the, the adversarial roles uh, in order to have a good teamwork, you have to really understand the, the motivations on the other side and of, of everybody on the team. Uh, so how can we as an industry really start to create that better, greater awareness and, and frankly, empathy among the different groups that are taught to not really work each other or be suspicious of each other or, or that the other side maybe just flat out wrong and think your own way. Um, any ways that we can start to, to push that, that greater awareness on the, the motivation side? So I worked on a um, an IPD-ish type project. It's technically not IPD because it wasn't that particular contract, but it was a public job that borrowed a lot of those same ideas. So we had um, you know, shared savings, we had milestone incentives, you know, everyone was still their own company. We didn't have to be, I mean, it was a public job. So we had to have a level of transparency when it comes to cost and labor and stuff like that. I mean, I think the interesting thing here is like, I feel like for us to be more, you know, collaborative and for us to, you know, understand each other a lot better, a little bit of it is opening up our books a little bit, right? Like having people understand, you know, what are generally our margins look like, where are we making our money? And I know it's like counterintuitive and, and it's hard, right? Because no one wants to open up their books. No one wants to, you know, show how much money they're actually making on the jobs, but it does seem like that is one way to understand. Like, you know, we understood, you know, architects tend to have, you know, small percentage of fees. So how can the general contractor maybe take some of the costs for software? You know, so there's a, I think there's a lot of things that we can do there, but in order to get there and that understanding, especially since our industry is so based on costs, like no one wants to admit it, but you know, at the end of the day, it all comes down to money and costs. And, and this is probably not just construction, but any business out there. Right. Um, so yeah, I think being transparent from, from that front and, and that's really, really hard to do, even if the clients require it or, you know, ask, like, it's just in the nature of our industry to not be transparent with that type of information. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly right. You know, as a project team is formed, people come together. <clears throat> the most important thing that can happen is to really understand the business models that, that the various participants uh, bring to the table and you know what their risks are, what their motivations are economically, because I think we'd all agree we're in this because we all love to build great stuff, right? I mean, nobody's, nobody here, I'm sure, is in it for the money. But at the end of the day, um, financial economic considerations uh, can undermine you know, the, 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 um, the, the loftier goals we have to, you know, collaborate and work together and do something great. They, they undermine all that. And the, 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 the clearest um, example of that, in my view, is in the traditional sort of design bid build arrangement, which nobody likes anymore and shouldn't, um, the, you know, the, the, the architects and engineers, because of the limited fee that, that Alice alluded to, uh, at some point become motivated by limiting their effort, you know, uh, uh, not, not, not overrunning their fees um, and doing less when it may be most critical that they do more. And the contractor brought to the table late uh, because he's, he or she is at a disadvantage, the contractor is motivated to preserve their profit uh, against all sorts of changes and uncertainties that come up in the process. And I think, you know, that same profit motivation is even true in construction management at risk because usually the, the CM or the construction team has made a commitment in advance of all the uncertainty being worked out of it. <clears throat> so um, people protecting their bottom line uh, become adversarial, even if they're you know, their, their, their purposes are more, are, are better than that. Yeah. And I think adding on to that, we now have another stakeholder, which is all the software providers, the software vendors, all the technologists, like a lot of the conversations that we have with a lot of the startups is like, 
who are you actually selling to and who are you adding value? And that oftentimes like does not always match. <laughs> so it's like, oh, I'm, you know, building this awesome piece of software that has, you know, like I got all, you know, productivity value, blah, blah, blah. But like, oh wait, I'm actually selling to designers or something like that. That's just an example. Um, but I think, you know, from the technology side, also aligning, you know, your value add with who can afford it is also something to look at. Uh, frankly, you know, when people talk about, I mean, the goal would be, in my opinion, the goal would be that the owners would end up paying for a lot of this software because at the end of the day, they're the ones getting the most value out of it, especially if you can bridge the gap between you know, all the different stakeholders within that supply chain. Um, but of course, you know, internal operations tools, whoever you're adding value for should pay for that tool. So I think, yeah, we definitely need to start considering, you know, the, the technology side to all of this decision-making as well as cost. Yeah. I, I think it's an interesting uh, little wrinkle that, that you bring up there, Alice, that, that not only do we have kind of this adversarial dynamic between the AEC uh, industry, but you, with the, the technology uh, and the, the software providers, you also get a little bit more, uh, another layer of adversarial <laughs> relationships of, of the software providers of like, why aren't you guys adopting this? This is you know, world changing <laughs> technology here. It's make everybody better. Uh, and then the uh, industry is like, well, cause it's, we have our own motives and this is not fitting into that. And, you know, I think that there's some uh, ulterior motives. Maybe that's not the, really the, the right phrase, but the, the AC industry or customers have that they're not really admitting to the technology providers because they want to keep their, their cards kind of close to the, the vest. Um, so yeah. from, from your vantage point, Allison, in dealing with all, all the, um, a lot of the new startups and everything, what are some of those motives that, that you have been coming across of, um, that they're not really admitting to the, the tech provider? <laughs> I mean, frankly, contractors need to stop thinking that, you know, the software that they're using is a competitive advantage, right? Like, I think a lot of people think like, oh, I don't want to give my data to the startup because they're going to have, like, I think like in their minds, it's like probably higher expectations than what people would actually do with your data kind of thing. Like, you know, I, I know when, um, just as an example, when Brick first came out, right, they were wanting to get access to a bunch of data, cost, schedule, project management data to provide you with risk analytics. And, and this was like a couple of iterations ago, right? Um, but there are a lot of other startups that want to provide some type of data analysis, um, like for contractors, depending on what scope they are. And the feedback that we've gotten from a lot of the contractors is that they are worried that if they give this data to the startup, the startup is going to train their algorithms on this data, and then the algorithms are going to help their competitors. So I think like within our industry, there's also this kind of lack of understanding of technology and data. And, you know, and, and that goes back to the lack of transparency and the adversarial relationship where it's like, oh, we, we actually have to, you know, we as a contractor need to keep everything internal because that's our secret sauce to winning projects or winning bids or whatever, right? So there really isn't this kind of overall industry collaboration. I mean, there is a little bit of that. I mean, look at CPC, there's a lot of people coming together to collaborate, but not on any kind of level where we can actually change a lot of the standards or, you know, you know, do some of the stuff that we want to do. Um, and I think it's that fear that, you know, we're going to lose our competitive advantage if we share our data, if we share our tech, or if we share our processes. When in reality, I think there's enough projects for you know, a lot of the contractors to go around. So it's just this like high, higher level of thinking that like, I don't know if we need a group to do it. I don't know if it's this group or if it's, you know, we just have to wait for culturally people to change. One question I have, Alice, is so when, when you go through and I, I see this aversion, I think we all see this aversion every day in one way or another. What messaging works or what, what have we seen? And I think this is a lot more provider heavy on this breakout right now, but from the contractor side, maybe Travis, I mean, I know you, you're, you're more on that side. What, what have we seen that works to help educate, as you said, on AI, understanding how 
people or contract or sorry, software companies are using data and things like that. Because I think you I mean that's a big thing I was hoping to sort of talk about today, though, is how what are the correct thought leadership pieces? What help people better understand so it isn't the providers against the contractors? I don't think it really is, but you I mean that that sort of notion or vice versa. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the contractor is going to hire like some PhD and blah, blah to help, you know, look into this and explain in diligence and whatnot. I think, you know, really the industry is based on FOMO. So if there's, you know, that one innovative contractor that you can get and say like, you know, I'm going to say DPR because I used to work there. So it's like, oh, well, deep, like we're working with DPR and, you know, they've opened up blah, blah, blah. Right. So I think it really just takes that one contractor to kind of work with that startup and like once you say oh this person's competitor or whatnot then you know they'll that you know contractor will start second guessing like oh well if they're working with my contractor you know and they're opening up and they're sharing this you know maybe that's safe and and we've actually seen that where you know contractors will just kind of look at and this is the same for investing it's like oh you kind of just look at who else has done the diligence and who has you know those relationships or partnerships and then people will fall on. I mean, just to add some color, I'll give you like a real life example. I mean, that that was exactly how we were able to have initial success with Pipe was kind of create that compelling event and telling a story of success via a real life situation. Um, and, and that helped us alleviate a lot of pain or pushback that we were getting from contractors simply by by showcasing a real life example. And, and Benny, I think that to, to carry on that point too, I think that that FOMO, Alice, is, is a great point because, you know, I, I, I give my organization a lot of credit because they were one of the very first in the subcontractor realm to, to, to create this role of a construction technologist. And once you start to see contractors starting to follow that along, then you start getting people like myself in the role, even people that come from an operations, because I'm the anomaly. I, I come from a technology background, but the people that have those folks that come through the operations side, they've always been the tinker or the techie, but when they get in this role, they can really kind of focus on it. And then you start getting kind of those, those internal champions and, and the FOMO starts to, to brew from there. Yeah, I've got a pretty interesting story about my old company. So uh, I was hired, I was hired by my old company back in 2011, when not only technology was shifting a lot, but also just the industry into more of these advanced uh, delivery methods. And the one thing that I find interesting about this topic and about the industries being at each other's throats all the time is that when I arrived in 2011, they were basically operating design, bid, build between the internal departments of the company. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't even design, bid, build with the people outside. It was like structural issues to set. You know, the drawing review team reviews it and it was very linear and all inside of one company that was, you know, supposed to be an EPCM kind of one contract stop shop. So I think that there's a lot of things at play here. And I think everyone has really honed in on what the first thing is and that's contracts and money, right? There, there are many times where the contract, the, the delivery method or the contract chosen will determine if our software gets used on a project or not. That's because, you know, we focus on transparency and, uh, you know, things like that. So in the same time, you've got the contractual problems, you've got the problems of the uh, cultural divides. And, and so, yeah, it creates a very interesting situation where, Ultimately, there's this kind of, you know, adherence to working with other people, but then there's also the money behind it. Because if you get the contracts written correctly to enable technology, even the people that don't want to work with the other people will do so because that's what they're being paid to do. So I think that those contracts and owner education have a lot to do with, you know, this adoption of standards across technology. I mean, look at what they're doing with IFC in Europe. I can write an entire uh, you know, template to go with open BIM projects in Europe because that data is, is known and it's delivered in a certain way. So it's kind of interesting because it is so multifaceted, right? You've got the contracts changing, you've got the technology changing, You've got, you know, people weighing where their risk is and what their, you know, it, what the risk is and isn't. 
And uh, the quicker we can all determine what this, you, you know, what these best methods are, I think the quicker we'll find ourselves, you know, solving some of these problems. Do I hear a, a, a question for you all of who are, you know, who are in the technology part, side of the industry? You know, do you find yourselves basically developing tools and selling to uh, various parts of the industry uh, in a way, uh, you know, support giving every 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 member of this fragmented industry his or her own, you know, special tools, but but not necessarily, you know, bringing all the the parties together up and down the chain. You know, I think I, I just a, a, a very quick anecdote. You know, I know uh, architecture firms and AE firms uh, have been. Um, largely dependent on the Autodesk platform, you know, Revit for, for years and have been very, frankly, and I, I say this from a perspective in the AI large firm roundtable among firm leaders, uh, firms have been very frustrated, uh, basically being kind of beholden to Autodesk and their particular tools and the costs, the rising costs of those tools um, and the relative lack of transparency and interoperability between those tools and others. So it's a long question, but do you all find yourselves kind of working through very different channels in the industry, trying to, to figure out how to bring them together? So I think what's ahead, happened, ben. yeah, I'm gonna take a stab at this one. So one of the things that we talk about a lot is everyone's a snowflake and right. So everyone thinks that they're a snowflake in there and we have many different vertical solutions and we have a very fragmented industry. And I think this is why we've come together from the CPC perspective to sort of understand as you're saying, Clark, what's that bridge that connects that? Because what's the, typically what happens in software adoption, point solutions or specialized solutions get adopted quicker before sort of more of these wider perspectives, also from a perspective of just dollars to develop, to develop everything, right? It's and also to, for someone to really develop everything and be really good at it is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think what's happening naturally is we are solving specific problems within the industry by trade or by department, though as our industry continues to mature, what we're finding is if the tools are built flexible enough that these can help sort of other trades or other maybe parts of the organization Though it's um, the bigger picture, and that's where the sort of CPC comes in, is how do how does this interoperability work to make it so the GC software is talking with architectural software, and what we come back to a lot is we follow the money. As sort of Brett was saying, and just because that's a lot of times we're looking up to the owner, we're looking up to who really makes the impact because we come full circle back to contract language a lot in our conversations, because at the end of the day, they go, oh, we can't do that because I can't submit in 3D in the contract. I still need 2D submittals or whatever it might be. Um, so that's some of the, the other reasons why we see not just from the software providers built into a specific niche, but then the industry as a whole with these sort of sort of built-in baggage. I don't know what, what to call it that we as providers look to. At the end of the day, providers are really, we see a problem or entrepreneurs a lot of times and we see a problem that's in there and we work with our clients to find a better solution for there. Though a lot of times that could lead people down a lot more verticalization. But when you really look at the difference between let alone an architect and a GC and a glazer, then you look at the difference between a roofer and a glazer or a mechanical contractor and a drywall contractor. There are still similarities, um, but they're just not as much though as we see, and this will be a, sort of a nice ramble here, but um, as we see stuff going more to prefabrication, I do see a lot more, at least what I'm seeing in my role now at M Suite, we're working with different types of contractors and we're like, we don't care what you're manufacturing. It all sort of like, it has a model, you have a component, it has to go to a station. And so one thing we're finding, which is pretty interesting, where we, we started a lot on mechanical, 
contractors and piping were finding that like, oh, you, you make wall panels? Oh yeah, we can help you. Or they're coming and saying, this is my problem. We're like, well, our solution does that. So I think it's, I'm hoping it's the evolution that happens naturally that contractors start looking and saying, okay, we don't need these one-off because niches, because we have a lot of legacy software that's out there that is super specific to one trade, one component. And typically that makes it harder for the larger interoperability that we're all focused on. Yeah, you, you know, I think, I think another interesting thing about this is as technology providers, is your goal to make money? Of course it is. Is your goal to change the industry? We all think it is, but you know, what exactly are you doing? And, and, and I hate to pick on, you know, some certain softwares that are out there and I'll uh, definitely not be specific, but whenever you take a piece of paper to a PDF, you're not changing the workflow. You're just putting a piece of paper on a PDF, right? As to where, if you really start to integrate everything, you face a lot more of those challenges. You know, it's easy for me to go to a drawing review engineer and say, instead of putting your red lines on this paper, put it on this tablet. That's not a huge workflow change, right? But there are purpose-built tools out there that advance that single person's, uh, you know, their ability to use that software. And I feel like as you get out into, you know, you take a problem and you make it a little bit bigger, right? Like coordination, for example, you try to start to solve all those problems and you start to have to speak, you know, nine or 10 different languages. And that's where, as Benny said, you know, things get really difficult, right? But Benny, I think you brought up a good point where if you get prefab people that have been doing spools and pipe, as Travis and I have found out, which I don't know if Travis is still in this room, but we found out that wall panels and prefabricated multi-trade racks and, you know, all those things, if you can just get the customers to see the 80% of their stuff that's like others, we can actually start to get to more of a, you know, streamlined workflow. And I think that's a really interesting point because that's what we're seeing today. And in my last company, we were really more of the take your process to paper type automating processes. And if we were doing a project management software for trade contractors, and it was just also the path of least resistance too, and it still got them to get to data. But I think what people are starting to find, I'm hoping today is that they're looking at it from a different angle. And I think that's what we need to do. And it sounds like so far we've said case studies or right user testimonials, but like, how do we get someone to not look at the problem the same way that we've always looked at it? I think is, I mean, that's sometimes the reason why going from blueprint to iPad in a similar fashion had been so successful, I think is because people could understand it if they went from going from blueprint to 3D, we're still saying here, let's extract the 2D out and let it talk to the 3D because maybe we haven't built it intuitively enough. Maybe it's education, I don't know. But I mean, this is the, I think where we're here of like how, how do we properly message to the industry and how does the industry sort of help to evolve quicker? Like how do we get more Travis Fosses in there that are saying, hey, let's tinker. There's got to be a better way. Um, and I know it's typically two steps forward, one step back, no matter what. But I mean, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to sort of figure out if there's any, I, I don't think there's any secret sauce or magic wand, but I was hoping maybe some people had some other, some other uh, things that they've, they've done. I do think that we've touched on it a couple of times. Is that a lot of times it does come back to that contract and the way the contract is written is we, we can have all these great whiz bang tools, like, like you said earlier, I'm still required to submit a 140 page PDF with little tick marks on the things that I want to buy. Like it, in, and until I, you know, and hopefully we're starting to get, we've done a couple of meetings with the CPC and, and a couple of owners groups. And I, I really do think that's kind of where the, the feel, cause, cause we use a lot of software, a lot of software is, again, for our processes. Sometimes I kind of wonder if our, if some of the software we bought is, um, kind of perpetuating this because we feel like we have to cover our own asses in some of this stuff. So some of the software companies out there have filled that role in the market. So I kind of worry, I, I worry that what there, there's a quote out there. I, I can't remember who said it or whatever, but you know, beware of the product that fixes the problem. What, you know what I'm trying to say? If there's a product there that fixes a solution where the problem, if it fixed, you don't need that solution anymore. You know, I, I'm not saying it well, but 
you have to be aware of those products. And I think that they might be targeting some, some different sectors in our industry. Like if, if we could just fit, figure out this iteration, you know, maybe that we don't need those point solutions anymore. Travis, I wasn't able to join, but I was on the MCAA conference last week, but I think you did a talk on how to break up with your provider. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Maybe sure. that's the flip side of it because, right, if we feel like we've made a commitment and we're doing something and either that, hey, we've not bought the right tool or just because it's worked for us for the last 10 years, is it really what's going to be the next 10, 10 years? And maybe that's a different aspect that we go i thought though i'm excited to watch the recording i haven't had a chance yet travis but maybe and i can... think that i mean i think that's part of it too is i think that um we, we've all pointed out in this industry that we're really slow to change our minds and and that also means sticking with a bad solution like we we have a pot committed or sunk cost mentality but we're just going to keep we're going to keep riding that horse until the legs fall off and i think hopefully um hopefully some of the you know and there's some SaaS models that theoretically make it easier to switch, but you still feel like you're kind of locked in because your data is there, or your process is there. But I think more companies are starting to get and get the idea that, you know, yeah, maybe it takes me six to eight months to switch my provider and it's painful, but I'll be better for that much longer until the next thing comes along. Yeah. And I think people have touched on uh, this a couple of times, but I think a lot of it's that education factor. Um, and going back to the question earlier about if like construction management majors are trained to hate architects and stuff. I'm a construction management major. I don't dislike architects or engineers. Um, if anything, it was Calc 5 that separated us, <laughs> honestly. Um, but I think a big thing that we're missing is that like none of these are really shown in, in education. It, like the, the education that I received was very uh, generic. Like I learned, I did learn how to weld. I learned how to make um, sheet metal um, connections, like all this stuff on top of managing projects. But I never really, and I don't know if this is a good or bad thing. I never got into a specific software besides go figure Revit, Autodesk. Um, other than that, they kind of left it open to us. So that's where personally I've taken it on. Um, I'm teaching at my alma mater now. Um, different software just to expose people just so you know hey you're going to go out into the world you're going to get a lot of stuff thrown at you there's a lot of solutions and just to let people know um, that what's set in place isn't really always the right thing you know you need that outside perspective to be like wow you guys have survived for 30 years doing this <laughs> you know so um, yeah I just think that's an important point to bring up too. So how do you go about really it's a fundamental mindset shift that has to happen among the industry to uh on risk management and data transparency how do you encourage that that mindset change to uh you know i think right now we're we're so focused on preventing risk rather than kind of letting go of the control and and frankly exposing where the risk might be and then that's where we can springboard off of that and gain these efficiencies and, and better collaboration and communication. Here's Write the contracts to fit. Go ahead, Clark. Just, just listening to, you know, listening to the, you all, uh, you know, is it possible that, that the, the, uh, the transformation of the industry really has to start at the project level? I mean, we're so entrenched in various silos uh, from a trade standpoint and a professional discipline standpoint, and in terms of the, the technology products that you are all basically developing for and selling into those silos, uh, wouldn't it make sense uh, at the beginning of a significant project that could bear this kind of pre-planning um, with the right owner uh, to bring all the people to, together at the table at the beginning, which should be done anyway, but basically to say, okay, you know, what's the very best combination of technology tools that we can assemble uh, to work well ourselves, but to also deliver the right, the, the best possible product to our, our mutual customer here. And I think the comment at the beginning, maybe Alice, you brought it up. Ultimately, one way or another, the owners, owner or the owners pay for the tools. Uh, just like they pay for saw blades in the field. I mean, it, it's just part of the process. So wouldn't it make sense to basically design the technology applications around the table 
to a, a significant project um, and figure it out there, I, I, I'll stop. That was something I wanted to add too. Um, I something I see holding things back a lot is that it's a lot of it's contract based, but you also like you got to implement per project. Everybody like yeah, you can have multiple solutions on different projects as long as you like focus on the project and the overarching making money on the project. You know, um, but a lot of times what doesn't happen is exactly what you just said, Clark. There's no explanation of how and why we're going to do all of this. So they start to do it. You get a little bit of pushback and then everybody throws their hands up and kind of walks away. Um, I'm proud to say I was actually involved in a project exactly like that. I got hired to be a cog in that wheel. Um, and then actually Revisto, where I'm at now, was also a cog in that whole plan. Um, and they're what they did was they sat down and they looked at the cost of the building and they realized BIM wasn't the big cost facility management for the next 30 years is the big cost. Right. And so they put it, they put the hammer down and said, we got an unlimited BIM budget, basically hire whoever you need to. Um, thank you for whoever made that call. <laughs> but um, at the end of the day, you know, they realized that, Hey, we, we might spend an extra million dollars to save 10 million over the next 30 years on this building. Let's do it. Um, and I don't think those stories are getting told enough. I think it gets back right? to the education piece. And, yeah. And the owner operator people. So like, how do we educate the buyers when they're flipping or selling these versus own, owner operators? Cause owner operators are looking at uh, how, that's what it's going to cost me over time. So maybe that's like, you go buy a car and does it have a VIN check or does it have, what's the cost of ownership of the Jaguar versus the Toyota? I don't know. I mean, and there's something to incentivize people to think that way. But, um, so, it, it, circling to what Travis Voss, you, you just brought up on that those stories aren't getting told. This is one of my, uh, this is a hot button topic for me, but why? aren't those stories being told? Why do we hold those stories so close to the vest and we're scared to tell them when it would help the whole industry? I, I, I don't know. I don't know if we kind of end up thinking where it's, we have that special sauce that makes everything better or we much rather talk about what went wrong than what went right. We don't really kind of analyze what went right and reapply it. I, I, I don't have a great answer for that. And I, I wish I wish there was one. And Travis, other Travis, I think you were speaking up. I'm sorry, I think I stepped on you. But. No, I was just I was just doubling down on on um, he, well, he was asking why people don't share. I mean, honestly, if you've been at the same company for 20 years, like you're probably not going to tell the bad stuff. You know, you're just going to make it all look glowing. Like, I'm not going to say that the experience I had was a glowing experience. We definitely were going rounds at times, you know, and and we're definitely better because of it. Um, but like, like I said, Todd, I, I think a lot of people are scared to either like embarrass their company or em, embarrass their selves and their processes or something, you know, um, I think that's a lot of it. Well, Todd, I'll be really quick about this, but let's say that you had a job where you got fired for a completely illegitimate reason, right? And you went to your new employer and they asked, why did your old job change? You would probably be like, well, we mutually split apart. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, so the thing is, is that you're, in a way, if you're known as the person that airs all the dirty laundry of the company, you're kind of putting your own career at risk for being one of those people. So I think that sometimes people have personal reasons not to share these stories. But is it dirty laundry if it's a success story on it? And you're saying how you moved it forward? Like if it was, I, I get the not sharing the the dirty laundry and of what went wrong but i don't think that we as an industry do a, a good enough job of sharing what went right and where the innovation is happening yeah i think oh go ahead well the challenge with that is how do you differentiate between the marketing bs versus the real stuff yes. like honestly i'm on linkedin and like to me the world looks like everyone does bim everyone does prefab everyone is perfect <laughs> everyone's ipd like everything is perfect like how do you differentiate the, that? Like everyone has a great marketing team and everyone appears to be doing so good. But like, I don't read any of the articles because it's like, okay, am I actually gonna read it, Read like what actually happened? Or is it just gonna be some marketing person that 
spun it in a way that makes it sound super awesome and successful. So I think there's also a part of that where it's not necessarily like the fake news situation, but it's like, how do you differentiate, you know, what's like, you know, actually value add to read versus what's just marketing. I, yeah. I think part of it too, to Clark's per, um, comment that kind of kicked this all off is, you know, it's, it's hard to run a true experience, experiment in construction because of all the risk involved. No, no owner is going to buy into something and, you know, for a, a half a half a billion dollar hospital, we say, we're going to try all this brand new crap and we'll just, we'll write a case study afterwards and we'll tell you the good, the bad, and the different. Because at the end, they, they still want a working building. So I think that it's hard to experiment in that way. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting catch 22 with this because, uh, mm -hmm. Alice, there's a, there's a gap <laughs> that the, us crazy marketers are, are, are filling. It. It's sharing those stories. It's like, well, somebody has to tell it. But I 100% agree. If other people were telling the stories of here's where the innovation, like putting it, the spotlight on, not that there's not people doing that. There are people sharing it. But if more would kind of fill into that void and share their personal stories, marketing wouldn't have to step in there in the same way and context. Um, but right now it's like, well, we, we're trying to fill that void. I would love for people to, to share those personal stories more. They're way more impactful than uh, a marketing spin any day of the week. That was not a, that was, I forgot that you were talking about. That was not. <laughs> yeah, sure, well, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> we're no longer friends. I was just kidding. I, well, I, I, I didn't think, take it personally. I just I wanted to, uh, I, I think that there's, it's this interesting dynamic that we got. Not just you. There are like project executives and project managers that post stuff on LinkedIn. And I'm just like, you didn't even work on this project or like, you know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's it's not even to say that what you see on LinkedIn isn't true. It's just only at one or two percent saturation, right, of the market. So you see, it's like, you know, looking at someone on Facebook, right? You see the happy family photos yeah. and all this, but you don't see, you know, all the other stuff. And it's the same way with LinkedIn or any of those other social platforms. I'm going to make a, make a, 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 a I'm going to throw this pitch out there and y'all can respond later if you if you're interested the, the the latest phase in our managing uncertainty research program was actually to test the idea of a database which owners would contribute to uh in confidence uh which would then accumulate actual project cost experience and it could it could relate to other aspects of the process as well uh, but in a way that would build a body of knowledge that people could go in and tap uh, without getting into confidential data about individual projects, but people could go in and tap to learn from a body of experience with other owners and previous projects that are somehow related to what one might want to do next. And the, everybody, owners have been very excited about it, very enthusiastic about it. The question is, who will actually own it? Who will host it? And uh, my colleagues at Dodge and I have talked to, to some providers of software, including Procore, for example, uh, about their possible interest in doing that, thinking it would be a kind of adjunct to things that, that Procore is doing anyway. But uh, they, and I think you all in the technology world are so busy with your newest product development, uh, you know, nobody's quite shown the bandwidth to actually do this. So uh, frankly, I and we are still looking for a possible uh, platform uh, that would make sense. It almost is like an industry, you know, kind of nonprofit venture, a platform to develop uh, and host uh, real data, the good, bad, and the ugly that can be uh, then shared and, and learned from. So if, if that resonates with anybody, I'd be interested to hear from you. Um, the, the thought I had, and again, this relates to, to the idea that maybe significant projects can, can be the major force for change here. I'm thinking, who gets to the table first? You know, you either have a very uh, enlightened owner who, who understands everything that you all have been talking about and brings all of that conviction to the table, or you have an owner that doesn't quite know all this stuff, and is, it, but is, is willing to be led. So who gets to the table first with that owner? 
Well, um, often it's the architect. Uh, it could be a um, program manager or a project management firm of some kind. And so my point is, those of us, and I, I take some responsibility for this as an architect, those of us who are kind of at the table first, I think, need to take more responsibility for putting the whole team together correctly and bringing the right tools into play uh, so that uh, so, so that, that, that the work flows better and the performance is better. I don't, I'm not sure we know enough to do it. You almost need a, a workflow versus um, like position in the company chart. <laughs> That's totally Brett's idea, by the way. He, he put me onto that this morning. And that, it sounds like exactly what you're talking about. Because if you have different workflows versus project roles, and you can see where those workflows overlap, you know, maybe we can focus on following that workflow down the path or seeing that, hey, architects are doing this too. Why don't we try it, you know? Well, the first step is making sure that the right people are, are at the table and are on the yep. team from the start. And, you know, that's such a big change for so many people. But sure. our, our, our research, for example, showed that, that projects where the contractor is on, the builder is on board with the designer from day one mm -hmm. are, are twice as likely to uh, meet their budget and four times as likely to come in on schedule than projects where in the traditional mode, the, the builder is hired based on the cheapest bid, you know, later on. It is unbelievable. So getting the right people at the table from the start is, is, is step one, but then talking together, perhaps with major trades, as well as the engineering disciplines and so on, talking together about the, the technology support that will um, enable that project to be most successful seems like a natural thing. Now, this might be a little off base, but I mean, what are your guys' thoughts on possibly seeing something like the UK BIM framework put in place here, where there are specific roles and responsibilities and communication trees that have to happen in order to get a project approved? Hmm. <laughs> Sorry for the crickets on that one. Um, no, we just stunned the crowd. I love it. Well, <laughs> you, you know, know we, I, I did a little bit of work in the UK and they moved up to level two in their BIM framework. And they do have specific kind of communication structures and responsibilities outlined for every participant in the project. Whether that lead participant is the contractor or is the architect, that is irrelevant. You know, they are basically just anointed as the lead party. And then everybody else essentially falls in line afterwards. But regardless of who is that lead party, there are specific team members that need to be involved at certain phases and there are outlined communication structures built into this framework. I, I honestly, idea. I, oh, go ahead, Nick, sorry. Well, no, I like the idea of the clarity of roles and responsibilities. I think that that's really important. Um, one thought that I had, because I do a lot of work on value stream mapping to understand what percentage of the work is adding value is maybe that's a different metric we could use. So we've been talking, I mean, this, this whole breakout was about creating shared purpose. And so I think the best way to do that is to get centered and have a true north around what does the customer value? And then perhaps we could, we could measure what is the percent that we're actually delivering on that value by value stream mapping, where are the waste? and then figure out for ourselves, okay, well, the target, you know, I'm sure that the, um, when you do this, the percent value add is astonishingly low. And, you know, it's probably like less than 20%, probably less, more like 5%, less than 5%. And so we could give ourselves a goal and start to work towards that because that would be the common purpose. And we would say, we're gonna use these platforms. We're gonna adopt this communication technique. Where is the waste happening? And also what that will do is by mapping this out. The other part that I like, which is really a mantra of CPC is shared pain. If you identify where the shared pain is, people are gonna to try to help people. But if they, um, 
if they're if they're just not aware of where the pain is, then they just you know we focus on the five who's instead of the five whys. So mm. you know I think those those kinds of things could be. I've never seen a contract with percent value add in our processes, um, like be a be a metric. But that would be kind of cool to give a shot. Because you know that that would that would trigger like may trigger a lot of what's been happening here, which this conversation for me has been cool, but it's been extremely tech heavy. Yeah, I love it. It, and to get getting back to Matt's point, uh, Matthew's point is that honestly, what makes that system work over there so well for them is predictability and data, and being able to know what's coming down the pipe and at what phase is it coming down the pipe? That's where all the benefit is. And, and what, what I feel like they're doing over there is very similar to how the GIS world works, right? Where the vertical part of the built environment is now kind of getting ingrained into what GIS was going through in the early 2000s, 2005, and all of that. And they eventually came to some sort of a standard, right? I can hop on a website right now and pull uh, civil infrastructure data on thousands of projects and crunch those numbers if I know how to work with the data. So yeah, it's, it, you know, the shared, I feel like the shared pain in a lot of this is nobody knows what they're getting when they get it, right? And they, they doubt that part of it and there isn't any trust behind it. And so we end up reworking a lot of stuff that adds to our inefficiencies. And, um, you know, it's, it, to, to me, it seems like the big shared pain with a lot of this is, you know, where do we start, right? Because we have a lot of these conversations that are really big overarching conversations. But if you look at the UK, they took logical steps to meet those goals. Now I work with some of these contractors in the UK and, you know, I'll be the first to say, it, a lot of them don't like it, right? They don't. They Nobody don't likes to be right told down. what to do. Nobody likes to be told what to do, especially yeah. by, by a government agency. So I get it. But like the fact of the matter is, is we're in a position where we have to reinvent the wheel every time that we start a project to make sure that we have data uniformity or data integrity. We can ensure data integrity, right? And if, if we even had something more firm like NIBS or, or some kind of actual kind of agreed upon standard where we knew that data could transfer across the trades and be still be valid, I feel like a lot of this would cease to be an issue, at least at the level that it's at. I mean, we, we develop and we've talked about, you know, how we have these point solutions and, you know, it makes people become more vertical. If we had some kind of data exchange standard that everybody had to follow, at the very least, we would we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel every single project. Matt, I, I would agree with you that there's no American that would do that, but again, <laughs> there, there are well, you actually, and you stopped Scandinavians in. That, that like standards and like to follow rules. So you just uh, jumped in and we were talking American about the thing. UK BIM standard. We were actually just mentioning the UK yeah. BIM standard I, I mean, and that's what brought that. I could have only assumed. <laughs> so, I mean, A, A and Z market, our Asia Pacific market, our UK market is, is very standardized, very standardized. And, and we can actually deploy templates with our software that adhere to most of the projects that they need over here, over in North America. And I'll give Canada a little bit of benefit here. They're getting there quicker than we are in the States but it only works, as Clark said, at a project level. We have never gotten a company to say, your solution is what we need company-wide. It I always think, starts at a project. I think one thing that we're confusing is standardization with usability. I mean, just because we're standardized and we're, we're submitting the same information, that doesn't mean that it's beneficial. Um, so I know a lot of counterparts in the UK and all over Europe that are like the standardization sucks and it's awful and we hate it. Nobody uses it. Nobody follows it. So just because we standardize doesn't mean it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think something we need to look at in the States is uh, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, how productivity hasn't increased in our uh, industry, but again, all the BS that we do has increased 10, 20, 30 fold. Um, so what what is the reason for the BS? How do we cut through it, and how do we make ourselves more efficient? 
Yeah, standards is only only good if people follow it. <laughs> and it's got to work for them financially, so. Daniel, you're with Walsh, I see. How do you approach this? Uh, so a swag is probably the best way to do it. Super wild ass guest on every project. Um, I, I think what you mentioned, oh, we're going to be kicked out here. Uh, I think what you mentioned earlier about planning on the project, I, I think it's too late personally. Um, but again, that's based on the project types, all of our mega projects. If you're planning your software suite, once the project's already kicked off, you're, you're five to six years too late. Um, smaller projects, easy. We can do that on a project by project basis. I do a technology kickoff project for every project over $40 million. Um, so we're aligning with that. And part of that discussion is let's bring the owner in and have a holistic conversation with the owner. They might not want to use our platforms. They might not the way uh, might not like the platforms that we're using, but we can at least come up with a holistic approach to how to leverage our platforms and theirs, whether it's an iPass solution, whether it's somebody sitting at a desk and transferring data back and forth unfortunately um you know there's there's a million different ways to skin that but uh we really look at it in a, a, a basis by ba or project by project basis um and we found tons of success with that um and open transparency with the owner um allows them to trust us that hey maybe we should open up the floodgates a little bit because paperwork is paperwork is paperwork but the usability and the, the, the effective use of that paperwork is the most important. If you're submitting an RFI and you're not using the response back effectively, you're not getting it back in time, what's the point of the RFI process? Just go build the building and we'll do it in the as-builds. Um, so uh, really, really teaming and transparency is probably key. Awesome. Well, this was a great conversation. We got 20 seconds. We're about to be booted back into the, the main uh, group. Thanks everybody for participating and your your vantage point on it, Allison and Clark. Thanks for being our our, our featured uh, participants here too. Thank you very much. Thanks, great comments. Thank you. The, you know the tactics that we use in this course are tactics that were um, used in the military. Uh, I train professional fighters on the side, um, and we use them for training uh, the the fighters. But we've converted them into a corporate friendly environment, and it, it, so there. In my opinion, there is no short term. Um, it's, it's being eyes and ears and, and letting them talk. But over the long term, it's about bu building the ability to uh, train your brain to perform under pressure. That's Whew. on that note. Go... That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, did, I mean, I, I, this, this is definitely the longest we've just gone. And every, I think everyone's just mesmerized. Anybody that came on midstream that was like, so you want me to put you in your breakout room? They're like, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm just going to stay here in mental health. <laughs>